when your pastor tells you to speak, you must speak. <laughs> and uh, we've been doing this series on Jesus the Evangelist. Uh, could, I, could I make a request? I mean, do those lights need to be on? They do. I, I know I got a black face and you need to see me. But uh, they're blinding me, you know. <laughs> but okay, we'll, 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 we'll work with that, shall we? We'll work with the bright lights. Are you in agreement, sis? Okay. Jesus the Evangelist. Uh, what I want to talk about, the subtitle of my message today is uh, Practicing Telling Others. Uh, I don't mean practicing like in a private room somewhere. I mean practicing telling others in real life. Amen? Jesus answered her. Uh, I'm taking this from John 4. Uh, the context is John 4, 1 to 10, or the whole chapter, if you like. But I'm just focusing on verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he have given you living water. Father, circumcise my mouth and uh, help me speak the oracles of God. Prepare our hearts and our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. John 1, uh, St. John provides us uh, a rich uh, 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 passage there where he talks to us about the principles of witnessing. In John 3, we encounter this uh, powerful man in Nicodemus. And in John 3, he lays out the theological message of the gospel. John 3, uh, verse 16, for instance, says, For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Goes on to say that for God, listen to this, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. I wish I'm evangelical Christians. Learned about that. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but he came to the world to save the world through him. Turn around to your neighbor and say, Jesus came into the world to save the world. That's the good news. Adam spoke last week about Jesus the evangelist, and he was encouraging us that the job of an evangelist is to equip the church, equip the saints for the announcement of the good news that Christ came into the world to save the world, not to condemn the world. That's the message. I better not preach. I was taught to speak. And I'm getting excited here. And the room temperature is high, and I want to keep cool. <laughs> That's the good news. Christ came into the world to save the world. And uh, our pastor read that passage again where Jesus faced Gethsemane, a place of squeezing. He was facing the cross. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. And Christ went on to the cross, and he died on the cross crying out to Telestai, the work of our redemption complete once and for all through Jesus Christ. That's the good news. We've got to go to people and remind them that at the heart of the gospel is a person, and it is the person of Christ. Christ who is fully God and fully man and will be forever. Christ who came to seek and to save that which was lost, and that's us. And that's the rest of the world. All through the centuries, Christ has paid in full the price. And now we have access 
to God. We can relate with God. We can live in liberty. And we are heading home. By the way, this is, uh, you're not paying for this, by the way, this bit I'm going to say now. By the way, I, I'm, I'm so glad that there are people coming back home that have been away. I, I, I'm glad you're back. Uh, all I want to say to you is uh, this, that God was telling me as I was sitting there, focus on the 80%, not the 20%. The 80% is the stuff that's going well with us. The 20% may be uh, the things you're not quite comfortable with and the things you want to complain about. But God is saying, focus on the 80. Because if you focus on the 20, you're going to be a real mess. In fact, if you find a church that's perfect, do not join it because you're going to spoil it. <laughs> Amen? The good news is that God so loved the world. The good news is God did not come into the world to condemn the world. Now, uh, let's see this uh, picture here. I mean, this guy is a shredder. I want to show you a shredder. Wonderful shredder. This guy knows how to shred powder. He can carve. He used to do freestyling, but not anymore. He's a bit old now. <laughs> I'm showing you that picture because I'm going to come back to it later. Whilst I've been preparing this message, God has been saying two things in particular. I want you to hear them. If you don't hear anything at all today, hear this. Number one, authenticity. God has given you a personal style, a personal profile. He's given you character and personality. He's given you passions, competencies, gifts. Whether they are natural or spiritual, he wants you to use them to the glory of his name. Right? So you got to remain authentic. A lot of people, when it comes to the evangelism or evangelism, they get so concerned about courses they've gone through, what they've heard about evangelism, and they try and copy or emulate other people. No, just be yourself. That's the first thing you got to learn. Just be authentic. And see what God can do. Because he's given you everything. You got it in your hand. Use what's in your hand. You know, the mistake I made when I was training to become a minister back in Africa was I tried to be my principal, who was American. And I ended up say, saying things like chapter, because he had a, a problem, a speech problem. And he couldn't say chapter. And he said chapter. And I, I started saying chapter. <laughs> God wants you to be you, not somebody else. So be comfortable in the design that God has made you to be. And when you are comfortable in who you are in Christ, the better of you, the best of you in Christ, as you grow daily to become more and more like him, watch and see what opportunities are going to come your way when it comes to sharing the gospel. So stop trying to be Somebody else or something else. Be authentic. Everybody say authenticity. Say shredder. Glory. I feel good. Okay, let's move away from that picture. The second word is sensitivity. God wants us to grow as Christians. The intention is for us to grow. Turn around to your neighbor and say the intention is for us to grow. Being sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit is important. As believers, we are enjoined to spiritual growth, as Ephesians 4.13 tells us. And we need to live in that discernment of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. So that we can hear what God is saying to us. When it comes to evangelism, if you are sensitive to the Spirit... It's amazing what God does. I was meant to tell you this story later, but let me tell you to you right now because it's perfect right now, okay? So I'm in uh, a resort, and I'm uh, the chaplain for three weeks there. I'm walking up the hill to collect my gear so that I could go and do the Christmas Eve service. And I meet these two girls, 
And the Spirit just uh, said to me, talk to them about the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what, well, these girls in France about the hypostatic union. He says, yeah, talk to them about that. So I said, hi, I'm Julio. I'm the resident chaplain. I would like to talk to you about the hypostatic union. He said, what, what the heck is that? And I said, well, it's just the fact that God, uh, Christ was perfectly God and perfectly man and will be forever. He had to be God because only God could save people. He had to be man because only man wronged God and therefore needed to substitute for the wrongs he had done. So Jesus was the perfect savior. So, said, oh, that's interesting. One girl said, you know what, before I came here today, I was talking to my mother back in Leicester, and I'm glad we got the Leicester crowd here. Amen? Uh, yeah, so my mother was saying, well, are you going to go to church? Because every Christmas Eve, they go to church as a family. And this was the first time as a family they were not together, so she was alone, and she didn't know. She said to her mother, in fact, I'm not going to church. And then she meets me, a priest, at a resort, talking about the hypostatic union. And she ended up coming to the service. Long story short, she did Alpha, came to faith. In fact, last week, I was having lunch with her at 7 before you had your dinner. <laughs> and she's now coming back and working with us at the resort. So be sensitive to the Spirit. Just be in touch constantly. Now, God has created you different from Julio Abraham, right? You're not going to go to people and say, what about the hypostatic union? It wouldn't work, right? Do not use my methods of evangelism. It won't work, right? People say, you know, Julio, you're larger than life. I say, what the heck is that? What does that mean? <laughs> you're flamboyant, plushy, yappy, prosperous. I'm thinking, who are they describing? It's all foreign to me. But that's how people see me. Right? But I need to live as the first person God intends me to be. There's a lot of work that God needs to do in my life to become more and more like Christ and to practice Christ likeness in me. But I've got to stay within the personal style and the profile that God has uh, given me. Say amen, somebody. Now, I want to look at, uh, very, very quickly now, four elements from Jesus' approach to the Samaritan woman by the well. As disciples, we are meant to follow and learn from him, our Lord, Jesus Christ. He calls us, number one, to care. That's what we see in this passage. He calls us, number two, to cross boundaries. Many of them man-made boundaries. Christ wants us to cross over to the other side, like he did in Samaria. He's calling us to connect with people. And then finally, he wants us to communicate the message with clarity and power. Are we okay? Well, that's the sermon. If you want to go now and, uh, and uh, rescue your roast, feel free. The black preacher is done. Yeah. Seriously, if you want to go, you can go. I, I've, I've got another 15 minutes, but you can go. <laughs> that, that's it. That's a message. Okay? So, <laughs> caring for the loss. Do you have a passion? Do you have love for the loss? Would you like to see more people come to faith? Would you like to see this church every Sunday, people queuing up to come in? Pastor Chipper, he's my Tim Hortons buddy. <laughs> and uh, he said something. I think uh, Pastor Ali reinforced it. Yeah, if you're wondering why I keep saying pastor instead of Chipper or Ali, because I'm a black man, and I respect those in positions of leadership. And that's how they taught me when I was young. So pastors, I love you. You're doing a good job. and Keep on doing a good job. 
And I want to I wanna thank God for this family. So we want to see people. We're talking about actually a massive revival, a great awakening in our city. And it's from here, I think the message was saying, that we're going to see people going, scattering around the world, planting churches, and seeing the world come back to Jesus from right here. But in order to do that, we must be a caring people. We must be loving, like Christ loved this woman. Christ was coming when she was going to Galilee. He didn't need to stop by in Samaria. He was a Jew. He was a man. But he chose to intentionally stop there because he cared for the Samaritan woman and he cared for the village where this woman came from to the point that he was worried. So in John, John is trying to tell us about the divinity of Christ, by the way. But here in this passage, we see the humanity of Christ. He was wearied, thirsty, exhausted, but he stopped, intentionally sacrificed to go and talk to this woman. Crossing all kinds of barriers because he cared. Do you care enough to even cross your street and go to your neighbor and tell them about Jesus Christ? A neighbor of mine walked past my house. I live on an alley <laughs> way, so I see a lot of people. I want to start some ministry of ministry, alleyway ministry. And this woman came and uh, she started talking to me. What, what do you do? Oh, wow, what a great opening. What do I do? I said, I'm a Christian and I tell people about Jesus. Oh, wait, do you have a church? I said, no, I don't have a church, but I belong to a church. So I started talking to her about Jesus and her issue with the church was twofold. Number one, she said, when my dad died, the vicar was so certain as to where my dad was going. And I didn't like that. Okay. <laughs> and then the second thing, he said, these Christians say one thing and do, they do the other. I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> For the most part, that's me. But I'm, I'm daily becoming more and more like Jesus. I'm becoming less and less of me and more and more of him. And I said to her, if you want to go to church to see perfect people, do not go. Go to a graveyard. There's plenty of perfect people there that will never say anything to you. They will never say back. Start a church in a graveyard. And you are the only person alive. But if you go to a church where there are people, you're going to find some issues. Or issues. Right? My daughter said, why, why do you say issues, Dad? I said, it's because it's me. Others say issues, but then that's what they want to say. <laughs> I say issues, Right? Do you care enough to go out of your way, cross boundaries in order to share the good news? What are some of the boundaries that Christ crossed here? We have a lot of barriers today in our world, right? He crossed ethnic boundaries. Race, ethnicity does not need to divide us anymore. We were created, one, as, a, as human beings. Christ celebrates our diversity. It was his idea. Amen? Gender, he created as male and female. Are sitting. Please do not tell this to anybody. I didn't put this in my notes, but don't. This is our top secret, right? I was sitting in a sauna in a place called David Lloyd, when I used to be a member. I'm no longer a member. I go running, cycling, bells, I mean, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> at, at home, in my garage. <laughs> but I was uh, wealthy enough at the time to subscribe to David Lloyd. So I was sitting in a sauna, and uh, the woman started talking about gender issues. She was talking about all kinds of genders, over a hundred types of genders, this, that, and the other. And, and then she said, I'm a psychologist. And uh, she's got a PhD in psychology. She said, uh, actually, biologically, there's only men and women. 
uh, physically, but actually people can choose whatever they want up here. So whether it's uh, the physical part or up here who you got yourself to be, it doesn't matter. Christ wants to cross all barriers so that he can share the good news with you and he's left us to do that. Amen? So we need to cross religious barriers, gender barriers, ethnic barriers, class barriers, and share the good news. I was going to ask you to think of uh, what are the barriers that you encountered today, but we don't have time, so I'm going to move on. Thirdly, he connected with this woman. As simple as this request was, it opened the door for spiritual conversation. Jesus basically said, uh, give me a drink. That sparked a connection, which then led to conversation. And from that, the woman and her village came to faith. So let me finish now by talking about communicating the good news. And I'm going to go back to that uh, picture and share with you a few stories and see what happens when you're authentic enough and sensitive enough to the spirit. Is that okay? All that in three minutes. <laughs> Brother, you promised me at half past. He, he did. He's my pastor, but he did. But now he's going to make me feel bad. <laughs> I'm the one running out of time now. <laughs> Communicating the good news. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He used the situation to point out some spiritual realities. In fact, here by the well, he made the analogy between the thirst of the body and the thirst of the soul so that he could offer this woman living water, eternal life. Jesus wants to offer people life and life in abundance. The world is hungry. The world is yearning for something better. I was in London on Halloween weekend. My daughter and I went to the West End. We went all over the place. Knights Bridge. I mean, we're doing London at night time. People hungry. People in Korea, we should pray for them. Hungry for something better, for something different. And, and going into the wrong kind of things. We need to point people to Jesus. That's the work of the church. Jesus offers life and life in abundance. Jesus came to give us life. Now, let me just finish by saying this. When I came to faith, I, I said this uh, last night, I was about 15 and a half, and uh, Joel, uh, Joel had invited me to church, so I went with him. And they explained the gospel. I said that I saw the revelation of truth about who Jesus was. And within 30 minutes, having objected, uh, uh, and having fought against Christianity, because for me, growing up in an apartheid country, I thought that Jesus was an oppressor. And the whole Christian world was a bunch of oppressors, because actually the church had come and just uh, done what the oppressors did, except for guys like Van der Kerm and John Stuart Mill, who stood against what the church were doing. Okay, But in the main, the church just went along with the apartheid. It was quite comfortable with it. Right? So, after having seen who Jesus was, that it didn't matter what color he was, it mattered who he was, I was ready to receive Christ. And my friend still didn't have a clue what to do. So I started right there and then explaining the good news. And he and I came to faith and were baptized at the same time. I went on to do a lot of uh, scripture union work in our country, and so a lot of young people come to faith. But more recently, I had a call from Geneva, from Saul Magura. He said, Julio, you won't know who I am. You took me to Matopos. You shared the gospel. I came to faith. I was about 10. I'm now running Redeemer Church in uh, Geneva. I want you to come preach for me. So I go preach for him now on a regular basis in Geneva. A boy of 11 or 10 came to faith. I've seen literally hundreds of people come to faith through the Alpha course 
And uh, I was actually visiting London, seeing some of those people, praying with them and encouraging them. But the best possible thing I could say is when I went to northern India, Kashmir, after an elder was killed because we were coming, the Westerners were going to be coming to share the gospel, and the elder was martyred for the gospel. We were asked whether we should go or not by the organizers, and I said, I am going, but I don't know about my team. My team and I met for prayer. We decided to go. We went to Kashmir. We planted churches there, the underground churches in Kashmir. I'm still talking to some of the guys. Some of the guys have become politicians, by the way, so now influencing power, positions of power, now influencing Kashmiri, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which is Srinagar, which is amazing. So I've seen God move. I mean, these are thousands of people underground. And then in South India, I've seen God move openly to people in uh, Vijayawada, which is amazing. But let me finish by talking about here. I was asked uh, to lead Alpha for a while. I think Simon is here. He, he leads Alpha now. Simon, are you here? He's here. Right. I, I used to lead Alpha with Simon and others. Ah, there he is. And uh, we saw all kinds of people, young people, middle-aged people, older people. But one girl in particular, Chantel, did Alpha with us. And we were able to see her go through the waters of baptism right here. It's happening everywhere. And uh, I just want to say to you this. Be real. Be sensitive. Thank you, brother.